reason I decided to give this particular talk today is because I was here for the opening of the behavioral lab um, earlier this year, and I did notice when a number of PhD students were presenting their work that there seemed to be quite a lot going on about the sort of social, you know, the social dilemmas and um, the, these sorts of questions and collective action and so on. I thought, I've got to talk about this, you know, I'm not something I'm working on too much at the moment, but I have a talk on this, and it's really kind of a really rather different perspective to the sort of the standard approach to this. It takes a, advantage of some sort of new developments um, that really try to rethink some of the fundamental ideas, such as uh, that you don't even really consider sometimes, like individual instrumental rationality, which is the way in which we approach the decisions uh, uh, in, in strategic situations and in collective, uh, collective social dilemma situations. So I thought, well, why don't I, rather than talk about something I'm doing right now, why don't I talk about uh, what I did a little while ago, and that's where this talk um, came from for today. Okay, well, the collective action issue has been around for a while, obviously, going back to Manka Olsen at least, um, and then, of course, uh, the late uh, Eleanor Ostrom, the first uh, woman to get the Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, this was really what she spent her career on as well. And then there was an article uh, she wrote probably about 15 years ago where she was reviewing the state of uh, the literature on all of this, and she was starting to bring in a lot of the behavioral game theory results, the experimental results, and saying really uh, that she felt this need, um, this needed to bring about a, a revised theory of collective action, of what, which you could say the whole team reasoning and we thinking idea uh, was part of that. So to try to capture empirical evidence of, you could call it excess cooperation or cooperation or contributions where, according to standard game theory with selfish preferences and incentives and dominant strategies and so on, you shouldn't really see as much as what we actually do find. And so maybe we need a different way of approaching uh, the way we, we tackle these issues in models in economics. And then this might also uh, reveal certain methods or frames, for example, that we could uh, use when we're addressing these real-world issues, which might actually encourage and enhance some of these cooperative or collaborative uh, choices, which in theory shouldn't exist at all by standard theory. So that's kind of the motivation here. So of course... Lying at the heart of all of this are two things that are fundamental to human society, I guess. The fact that we follow incentives, our selfish interests and so on, and we get markets. Um, but of course, we're also ultimately uh, creatures who live together in uh, societies. And of course, they're societies which have grown dramatically over the millennia uh, from the ones we would have evolved in. And it's like an eternal human uh, conflict between the, ten the tension between social interests and private interests and how we balance these and where there is uh, problems with the way in which game theorists have approached uh, these issues. Okay, so you're all familiar, of course, with the uh, standard prisoner's dilemma framework and then the generalizations of this to get your bigger uh, social dilemmas. And... There is some evidence, if you look at the evolutionary psychology uh, literature as well, that our whole moral sense may even have come about because of the selection pressure uh, to, to achieve uh, collaborative and cooperative uh, interactions to address or at least ameliorate to some extent some of these collective action issues which would have been a perennial feature of uh, human existence. And there has been, if you look at some of the sort of survey literature as well, there has been research which not surprisingly shows that if you're cooperating at all in one of these dilemma situations, you have a negative judgment, moral judgment, against people who are free riding. Um, but it's a little bit compromised because the people who are having the negative view are also suffering as a result of the free riding of others. Um, but there has been more recent work showing that even when you have unaffected parties who aren't adversely affected, they also morally condemn. So there is, we do have this inherent disposition uh, which probably is an evolved uh, disposition towards uh, thinking everybody should be contributing to some degree or playing our part in achieving a collective goal, in addition, of course, to acting on our own self-interest. So I guess this is where the whole tension comes from. Uh, if you look at some of the evolutionary literature applied to many situations, from your vampire bats, which will share 
uh, they will share blood with another bat who, who shares with them and so on, because each of the vampire bats needs to drink blood like every 48 hours or you literally you die. Um, so you do have some sort of um, uh, sharing buddies who aren't necessarily related. So of course you've got kin selection, as you'd know, um, relatedness, uh, repeated encounters, uh, reputation effects, spatial clustering, so you might find people who co cooperate are more likely to interact with other cooperators. And uh, some group selection, not the old uh, discredited versions, but there are newer versions of group selection uh, at the tribal level that do seem to operate. Yeah? Is trust part of these? Well, with, with, of course with the animals, uh, not, not so much, but uh, in the human applications, and trust and trustworthiness will, will come into this, yes. But there was a survey, as I say here, Noack, uh, I think it was in Nature or something, he reviewed these and, and the critical formulas which uh, show you uh, or predict or help explain when the cooperative action will happen within the animal kingdom and when it won't. And it turns out that in each of these cases you end up with a formula. The actual elements in the formula are different because the applications are different. But what they all boil down to is like a cost to donor, benefit to recipient ratio in all different applications. So it's a sort of a really kind of intuitive uh, explanation too. And I mention this because the mechanism that I derived after applying these sort of ideas in we thinking, we reasoning, to game theory, um, if you actually try to interpret the numerator and denominator, you get once again a ratio that you can interpret as a cost to donor benefit to recipient ratio. Okay, so that's just to flag where we hopefully will end up if I don't run out of time. <laughs> Otherwise, you have to ask me back to finish it. Okay, well, game theory obviously gives us a framework for analyzing strategic uh, interactions, strategic interdependence. Of course, some people say, well, it's really a, a mathematical uh, system of, you know, uh, solution concepts and the rest of it, and you shouldn't really be trying to test game theory. That's not what it's for. Um, and that's still an active area of debate, by the way. And Reinhard Silton himself, another Nobel laureate, does indeed do his own game theory experiments, despite having said this. Um, but what uh, the sort of approach which I, I'll be taking here builds on some work by Michael Bacharach, who, who died uh, about 14 years ago from Oxford University. And he was an early contributor with Robert, Professor Robert Sugden at East Anglia in developing a lot of these basic ideas. And then Golden Sugden finished all of his notes to create the book uh, Beyond Individual Choice, Teams and Frames in Game Theory, which came out in 2006, four years after Bacharach died. So they were saying game theory confuses the world as seen by the theorist with the world as seen by the decision-making agent. And of course, if we're interested in understanding human social phenomena, then of course we need to pay attention to what people actually do, rather than what a set of either Mr. Spock's in Vulcan or a set of uh, John von Neumanns, who are equally brilliant uh, on Earth, uh, would be doing. So again, if you look at some of the um, methodological economics literature, there is another debate about are we trying to describe idealised players in abstract worlds or are we trying to understand real players in human societies? Just another way of saying the previous point. So what we try to do then is bridge the gap by our experiments in behavioural game theory back from the theory and theoretical developments back to try to understand actual patterns of human cooperation and coordination and, the t and how we decide when we're going to be indulging our cooperative impulse or when we're going to back off and follow our selfish interests. Okay. Okay, one simple game that uh, both Bacharach and Golden Sugden use near the beginning to highlight some... Oops. Uh, help. How do I go back? That um, uh, key here? Ah, good, okay, that's fine. Uh, is this game called a Hilo game? Um, if you actually get people to play this sort of game, you'll find almost everybody chooses AA, and you get 2-2. Two, two. Um, so it's very easy for humans to solve and play, but theory actually struggles a lot more with it, because you've actually got two uh, equilibria here, 2-2 two, two and 1-1, one, one, or B, AA and BB, and, and you can't really know for sure what you should be doing until you know for sure what the other person's doing, but they're in the same situation. And so really it doesn't actually give you a clear prediction and answer here, even though humans find it quite easy to solve this one. This is a kind of a mixture of cooperation and coordination. So here's another quote from their um, 
finishing of Bacharach's book, if we find standard game theoretic reasoning cannot tell players how to solve the trivial problem of the high-low game, we may begin to suspect there's something fundamentally wrong with the whole analysis provided by standard theory. Okay, now, if you look at Bacharach's book, um, the set of games, if you try to sort of keep them as simple as possible, we focus on the two-player versions. And the set of games where you actually still embody some degree of this tendency, it's not restricted to just Prisons Dilemma games or Prisons Dilemma and Chicken games. It's a bit wider than that. It includes as well at the limit games like the high-low game. So first of all, we just want to sort of say, uh, what are the set of games and situations that we think some of this we thinking can help us to uh, better understand human cooperation. Prisoners of them are obviously the most controversial one. The other games, you can justify some cooperation. It's just that you don't get as... It, you can't really explain quite as much, given people's beliefs, as what actually occurs. Okay, so even when you look at... One shot prisoner's dilemma games, and I've done these experiments for real money here at UWA in previous years myself. Um, and I have managed to get uh, in one shot games uh, where people don't know each other and the rest of it uh, cooperation up to about 55%. Not really higher than that, and I haven't found other people getting higher than that either. And what I was doing even there, and we'll talk about this later, is I was keeping the prisoner's dilemma structure but making it as favourable to cooperation as possible. In other words, I was changing the cost to donor, benefit to recipient ratio implicitly. A lot of people say, well, you can't justify this. It's, it's irrational. Um, it's an embarrassment to the people who do it. Uh, even though it's something socially desirable, you could say. We're solving some of these public goods issues or social, uh, social choice issues successfully. It's interesting, though, because even though it's quite transparent that you're choosing a dominated option if you view the choice as one for yourself from an individualist framework, um, I do many other experiments, too, over choices between lotteries, and sometimes you throw in ones where one lottery transparently dominates the other, even by only a very little amount of money, and you get very little violation of transparent dominance. If the dominance relationship is hidden, you get higher than this, but if it's transparent, people don't really make mistakes. So why is it they're making mistakes here, or are they not making mistakes? Mistakes are only mistakes with reference to some particular theoretical framework. Okay, so maybe it's the framework that needs review. Okay, but he doesn't focus just on those games because he said this is just uh, like a more extreme case of a more general phenomena that applies to a, a larger set of games. And this is an analogy I'll, I'll come back to at the end. This is a bumblebee. Uh, and the flight of the bumblebee used to be seen, and there's literally uh, papers out there that say uh, it's impossible for the bumblebee to fly. It's aerodynamically impossible. We know the laws of aerodynamics. We've got planes, and it can't work. And so bumblebees don't fly. And they literally have said that. It's amazing. I, I've followed up on it. Um, and similarly, choosing a dominated strategy in these strategic situations is an affront to game theory. And you're an idiot. You know, and the bumblebee's an idiot for flying when it's not allowed to. OK, well, the standard way of setting up the two-player games, we could keep them symmetric in all cases here. There is quite a bit of evidence, actually, to show that once you start making some of these games asymmetric, so the benefits from cooperation and the benefits to the individual start to diverge, you actually get quite a rapid drop-off in the successful cooperation and coordination. It just adds an extra dimension of difficulty. So we don't look at that. These letters here, apart from choices A and B, RR is the mutual reward payoff for mutual cooperation. PP is mutual punishment payoff. T is the temptation payoff. S is the sucker payoff. So if you cooperate the other defects, you're a sucker, and they get the temptation payoff. So the way the payoff orderings work in the sets of games we can look at, well, we want to have, obviously, reward bigger than punishment. We need to have reward bigger than sucker. We need temptation bigger than sucker. If you then take all the games that fit that, uh, excluding one where, in fact, you still get dominant from both... It fits those criteria, but it's dominant from both perspectives, so it's not worth experimenting on. Uh, but apart from that, you end up with these ones, TRPS, Prisoner's Dilemmas, TRSP, Chicken Games, RTPS, Stag Hunt Games, and RPTS, Tender Trap Games, which are also another version of Stag Hunt to some people. 
Uh, on top of that, you can have intermediate cases where one or two of these are equal, for example, or you get the same numbers. And that's what the high-low game is, for example. So if you include those ones as well, that's the spread of games. That's a set of strategic interactions in their toy game form uh, to, uh, to help us understand social phenomena that this whole topic is about. Okay, now, you'd be familiar with the basic arguments about why cooperation is a mistake in prisoners' dilemmas. People say, ah, you know, people cooperate because you're using dollars or pounds or whatever in these experiments, and uh, strictly speaking, uh, the payoffs in the game, that define the game structure are utilities. They're not pounds or what have you, even though those might be quite relevant in applications like your, your PhD students use. Uh, but strictly speaking, for game theory, that's not what the payoffs are. Um, and then they say, if, if you care about what the other player is getting as well, then you need to be including this kind of social, social preference into the utilities themselves. And it's only after you've done that that you can say you've now got a game structure and you can see if that game structure is in fact a prisoner's dilemma. And so that using that kind of way, you can tautologically define any cooperation as, uh, as wrong. But that itself is premised on this whole approach of individual instrumental rationality. And so that's what we want to have, take a little bit of a philosophical look at here. There's been a number of philosophers and economists too who've attacked this. Uh, Gautier was a famous one. Uh, his reply to Ken Binmore, who, when he was saying this stuff, was standard theory leaves no conceptual space between preferences, meaning the utilities, and the choices, the decisions that people make. And he says that means it's too impoverished to provide a, a sensible theory of rational action. Another philosopher, famous philosopher, Robert Nozick, uh, he said, also talking about these kinds of games, if the reasons, again, this is some of your motivations which should be in your utility, if the reasons for doing an act A affect its utility, then trying to build that utility of A into the consequences which are a result of the act A, you therefore change the act and change the reasons for doing it. So the whole thing starts to become rather incoherent for certain types of motivation. Certain types of motivation. And uh, Robert Sugden and uh, Martin Hollis, who was a philosopher, Sugden, again, professor of economics, famous one, he said, Savage's axioms, and this is where utilities come from, Savage's axioms serve to rule out accounts of motivation where the source or character of satisfactions affects the agent's attitudes towards the consequences, right? Or where principles enter into the description of the acts. So to this extent, those utilities do actually exclude certain kinds of motivation, including the kind of motivation that we're interested in. So in fact, you can't bundle everything into those consequences without stuffing everything up. Okay, so in this situation, um, any meaning a choice in a game have depends on the characteristics of the options you reject as well, right? Because when I'm making this decision, it's partly because I know what would happen if I made a different choice. I'm sort of looking at the configuration of payoffs to myself and the others. And if my attitude towards those matters, that attitude can't actually be built into the consequences. Okay? Whereas the literature is just carried on as if you can, and now, no, everyone's making a mistake. So Nozick referred to this as symbolic utility. Okay, so the standard way of reasoning, individual instrumental rationality, or me reasoning, is actually a special case of a more general case uh, for when no particular substantive meanings are attached to the choices. Okay, but it may be the case that when I look at a prison's dilemma and I see the configuration of payoffs, that it's my attitude towards a cooperative choice in this particular situation that is giving me the motivation. In other words, if I perceive this as a choice for us, this configuration of payoffs triggers a motivation of we reasoning. And Sugden's gone through and sort of axiomatized all of this kind of stuff, if you want to see, uh, as an alternate, equally valid uh, mode of reasoning. So if, if the particular choice situation triggers a we reasoning way of interpreting the, the, the social dilemma situation, then you're perfectly justified in doing that, and it doesn't change the game to some other game. 
So if I'm making a choice as part of a team, or in a two-player case, a dyad, then I'm using re-reasoning. Now, I'm not saying everybody uses re-reasoning. I'm not saying that even someone like me who does use re-reasoning uses it all the time. Okay, we'll get to that uh, in a minute. But it does give us another way to reason from payoffs to decisions, answering the point that David Gautier was using to criticise standard logic. So again, uh, the way that you choose, honour and stuff, these things also can't be bundled into the utilities. Okay, just very briefly, where it might have come from. Uh, Bacharach discusses this stuff at some length in his book about... You wouldn't expect, you know, if we do have an evolutionary disposition towards cooperation and coordination, you'd expect it to just be one, really, which applies across a broader set of games. It's facultative rather than specific just to dilemmas or just to co uh, coordination games or something. So you'd expect it to be kind of a cross game in this sense. And there is some literature on the origins of we thinking as shared intentionality, even why with humans we have the whites of the eyes. Okay, if you look at the other 200 species of primates, you don't see the whites. And that's because tracking what other, the other members of the tribe are looking at, they don't have that cognitive capacity. But we had the evolution of being able to track what others are thinking. Shared intentionality, which has literally made a change to our, our eyes, um, in the time since we separated from a common ancestor. Okay, now, to get back to the, the key tension, because of course we're not trying to say that you know, everybody does or should cooperate uh, all the time in these situations, regardless of what others are doing. That's a kind of Kantian golden rule. You know, uh, act the way you think everybody should be acting in these situations, regardless of whether they do or not. Not many people do that. So, of course, you have to sort of bring in uh, what Baccarat called it circumspect we thinking, or we need to have a way of balancing our collective and individual interests. So this is really where my model came in. There is a model in Baccarat's book, but, of course, you see, he died before it was all done, and his model actually doesn't work at all. Um, but uh, it didn't really make a lot of sense either, I thought. But, but you see, you can't blame him for that, because he, you know, he, those, those later chapters were the, least, uh, sc the most scrappy. He hadn't developed them well before he passed away, suddenly. Okay, so just to um, bring it back to how the models look, um, I can have beliefs, I can, if I'm player one, I can have beliefs about what player two is going to choose. Let's say A is the more cooperative and B is the more defecting or selfish choice. So then if I think, okay, if I want to choose option A myself, what's my expected reward from doing so? I assign probability P that you cooperate, one minus P that you defect. So those would be my payoffs. Similarly, if I defect, I have probability P for getting temptation, 1 minus P for getting punishment. And then you've got like your mixed strategy. Nash equilibrium is going to be the point where your P equals the critical value P star, where these two are equal. So that's going to be your switching point. So if your actual belief is above or below this, it tells you where the understanding theory this is. You should be cooperating or defecting. Again, in the prisoner's dilemma, there's no P between 0 and 1 that will let you cooperate. It's a dominated choice. Uh, but for the other games we're looking at, like chicken games, stag hunt games, tender trap games, it does matter. It does matter. Okay? You can cooperate and you can defect. So if a person doesn't use this we thinking frame at all, this is basically how you approach these situations. You never, you never cooperate in any kind of prisoner's dilemma and your cooperation level in the other sorts of games we're talking about is dictated by this rule. Okay, what we do is we try to bring in uh, a modification to these to take account of we reasoning. Uh, to keep it simple, we embed the standard model within this. So if this new parameter, we, I'm just calling it C, if it equals zero, it boils down to what you've just seen. If it equals one, this is where um, it's going to, well, when you see the formula, it will mean that we either both do AA or we both do BB. Okay, so A would always be optimal in those cases. Those aren't the very interesting cases, though. There's no trade-offs. Because, of course, the trouble with this is it doesn't allow for any individual uh, interest at all. 
And as people like to say, you know, there is no I in team, right? So you should be cooperating and coordinating with your colleagues. Uh, but there is an I in circumspect, and it turns out there's also uh, an I in team as well, if you look carefully. <laughs> it's, it's hidden in the A-hole. So there's a way of balancing the two. Anyway, so I won't go into the derivation. There's no, no possibility, possibility here. But basically, this is how you do it. Um, you still need to have this weight here plus this one equal to 1, obviously, and this one to this one equal to 1. And the difference between the doing the same option is exactly C higher than doing different. And similarly here, this has got a minus C compared to this. Okay, so you can see where the logic of it would come in, but I won't, I won't go into the derivation. So this is the modification of the model, and of course it turns out if you plug in C equals 1 here, the only things that can happen are this and this. If you plug in C equals 0, you get exactly the expression I showed you before from standard theory. So this is the way of balancing the two. And if you find out where the switching point is in terms of C, it's going to be a function of P, but we'll get to that. Once again, you'll have a critical value. And exactly where this is depends on your beliefs about the other player's choice and also the specific parameter values in these games. And it turns out, I'll let you think about it yourselves, but it turns out you can pretty much interpret the numerator as the cost to the donor of their cooperation to the benefit to the recipient of others' cooperation. So it fits that same kind of evolutionary <coughs> threshold which applies throughout cooperation in the animal kingdom. So if my particular disposition to act on we thinking in this situation exceeds C star, I cooperate, even if it's a prisoner's dilemma. If it's less, I defect. So I'll show you how uh, this plays out. Here's an example of a chicken game. So those are the values of those particular letters. Plug them into the critical value here. It simplifies, in this case, down to 6p minus 2 over 6p plus 4. You can draw that in a uh, simplex unit diagram. Oh, go back. Okay. So here we have, just this is your belief from 0 to 1 about the choice the other player is going to be making. And this is your uh, disposition to act on we reasoning. Okay, between 0 and 1. And the Kantian straight at the top, selfish people right here. Um, the chicken game here, you see, even if C equals zero, so standard theory, if my belief about the choice of the other person uh, will choose A is greater than one-third in this particular game, uh, I'm going to defect. If it's less than one-third, I'm going to cooperate. So you don't even need to look at the vertical axis here, just look at the horizontal. But when you take into account we thinking as well, we're now looking at a square rather than the horizontal bottom line. Okay? And then what we can do, a couple of simple assumptions for experimental testing later, you can effectively just compare this area with this area okay, for simplicity. You just use integration by parts to calculate those things. Okay, now I'll show you for Prison's Dilemma. I will be able to speed up soon. <laughs> uh, here's a Prison's Dilemma, a typical one. Plug the numbers into my formula. This time you've got this ratio over there on the right. And this is the kind of diagram you get. Now, what's interesting here is, um, first, you can see the critical value line no longer intercepts the horizontal axis. Why is that? Because uh, if you have no positive value of C, you can't justify cooperating. You have to have some degree of reasoning. Okay? In this particular game, it's got to be at least a quarter, at least a quarter if you think the other person is likely to cooperate. So it's downward sloping, which also makes sense. Okay, so just quickly get into the experiment. So I had to make some assumptions about how your beliefs are distributed and how people are distributed in the space. People can make different assumptions, just use the model, plug the numbers in. And then I'll tell you what the experiment did. So we assume here, and uh, there's social psychology evidence, there's evidence from pretty much everybody's experiments in economics on this, these topics, that a whole bunch of people... They never seem to show much cooperative disposition unless they've got a big sanction coming up. You know, if they're going to get punished for their defection, then they'll cooperate. There's research on that too. But in this situation, there's no punishment. So you're going to get only about half the people, roughly, who are prepared to we-reason in this kind of a game. In games where uh, 
it's more about coordination as well, like stag hunt. Then you can see everybody's going to see it that way. So what I do, for practical purposes, just make assumptions on the distribution of C and P. And again, people could contest it, but I say PD and chicken games, half the people will get a Wii frame triggered from the configuration of payoffs and half won't. In the other games, like in high-low, we know everybody cooperates there, right? Uh, so in those other games, um, it's more just a coordination issue which might lead to defection. That's the only thing. So in those situations, pretty much everybody implicitly uses a Wii frame. It turns out that the, my model and standard theory don't predict very much different in cooperation for those games. A little bit, but not much. The real difference is for chickens and prisoners' dilemmas. Okay, when you use we reasoning, um, me reasoning, sorry, we just use what fraction of the P line justifies cooperation and what fraction justifies defection. And then when we use we reasoning, we just use the fraction of that square that is above the line or below the line. Okay, I did two experiments on this. One of them was done here at UWA. One was done at the University of Arizona. The bigger one was experiment two. That was done here, UWA. We use symmetric payoffs, as I mentioned. Two-player games. And we don't use the design like double-blind and things where you're really trying to see if you can get cooperation down to nothing, which is what some people seem to like to do. I'm not trying to get cooperation to nothing. I'm trying to account for the variation in cooperation. That's a different motivation entirely. Still, no communication. Uh, random lottery incentive system applied to games. These are standard things in experimental economics. Um, for 30 of the people here, 15 males, 15 females, the first ones, we also, for a different paper we did, we had anthropologists doing anthropological interviews on them about the frames they brought to these games. And they're quite, it's quite interesting to read that paper, but basically many students didn't like the anonymity at all. They really wanted to know who they were interacting with. That's a very human thing. Okay, so the first experiment in Arizona, I sort of spanned a bunch of these games with different tensions of cooperation and defection. The experiment here was just Prisoner's Dilemma games, one shot, and chicken games. And we also elicited beliefs and lots of things. Okay, just for a com uh, consistency checks, uh, to make sure we're getting the stability to some degree, at least at the aggregate level, uh, repeat a couple of the games within experiments and in between experiments to see what differences there may be. So that's what I did. Uh, the results of those, uh, the differences were really pretty minor for the same game. And if you look at the individual level, uh, you've got nearly 90% who are reasonably to strongly consistent in the kinds of choices they're making. Okay, so what about overall? Well, across the 25 games, um, I can't really show all of that stuff here, there's not time, but uh, across the 25 games, which covered the whole set we were talking about, we got... Ver Aggregate cooperation levels were as low as about 9% and up to 91%. And if I look at the correlation coefficient between my model's predictions and what actually happened, it's very high. If you use an ordinary least squares regression, because it's easy to interpret, you can see, look at the F statistic there, just on one explanatory variable. Um, it was this. Of course, OLS is not quite econometrically the right thing to do, so we also used... Um, a generalized linear model because the dependent variables are proportion, so it can't go from minus infinity to plus infinity. So we're correct for that. And then when you convert back from the logs and the rest of it, uh, it predicted a range of cooperation in those games from 9.4% to 85. The actual was that. I'll show you the distributions in a minute. Experiment two. In those, we got variation in cooperation from just in chicken and prison dilemma games from 7% for the really nasty PD to 89% in a very pleasant chicken. Very high Pearson predictions versus cooperation. The OLS, you can see just how close to zero this is and how close to one that is. Look at the F. <laughs> I know it's not statistically perfect, uh, but, but that's saying that it's predicting damn well. All right.
Again, we did it with the generalised linear model too, and the predictions there were about 11 to 91, not far off there. Because um, I use the same experiment, even some of the games are the same, I've got the same ideas that I'm testing, so you can add the 40 games of experiment 2 to the 25 games of experiment 1. So across the 65 games, that was the R, OLS regression, close to 0, close to 1, F of 690, this is one model prediction, generalised linear model, 8.7 88.7, very close to the actual. And this is what the games look like. Okay, this is the percent who cooperated, and this is predictions from my model, plus those assumptions on the distribution of uh, beliefs and we reason, degree of re-reasoning. If it was perfect, you'd have a, you'd have a 45 degree line. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's not far off either. Right? For a whole range of prison dilemma games, a whole range of chicken games, and some other types of games too. You can see which experiment they were from and what type they are by the colour and shape. So prison dilemmas don't really go above about here. Uh, chickens don't really go below about here, but they go up quite a way. And so on. Okay, uh, I also, on the first experiment only at Arizona, I did actually ask people to describe your disposition. I don't want to talk much on this, but um, basically what people picked of these, there were 81 people in that first experiment, uh, what they said was 15, basically, this is self-identified, right, but 15 went for the selfish option. They said, yeah, I'm selfish. <laughs> I chose selfishly throughout. Five basically were acting like Kantians on the golden rule. Uh, 44 were conditional cooperators, self-identified. One just altruistic, one competitive. 13 um, were maxi-min, which means you cooperate in a chicken game, defect in prisoner's dilemma, for example. But they said that was their guiding principle, to make the choice which had the highest minimum payoff for them. And zero chose no preference. Two were confused. Okay, so some of the implications are, given that we have, we derived a um, cost to donor benefit to recipient ratio, consistent with the rest of the animal kingdom, seems to work for our disposition towards we reasoning in game theory. So if we can frame the decision, frame the choice that you're trying, if you're trying to intervene in some country to boost cooperation levels or conserve fish stocks or anything like this, try to frame, frame it very much in a way that promotes the we frame, Okay, because if you change the perceptions of the costs and benefits, you will change the behaviour, even if you don't actually change the real ratio. If you change the perception of the ratio, you can change behaviour. So focus on ways to reduce the perceived or actual cost of contribution or boost the perceived or actual benefits to the group from cooperation. Some of the implications... So it is possible to uh, have some, uh, we don't need to have necessarily you know, government forcing everything. If you, if you manage to uh, frame the problem cor uh, correctly or you can tinker somehow with the, the costs, and costs to donor benefit to recipient ratio, then you can improve a cooperation in your application. Um, in 2005, there was a paper that came out on the aerodynamics of bumblebee flight. Um, and they finally worked out what it was, and this is what they were saying in there. They said, bees have symbolised the inadequacy of aerodynamic theory applied to animals and the hubris with which theoreticians analyse the natural world. They worked out that you, ha you get an extra vortex effect which causes extra lift when you don't have a fixed wing, and these wings aren't fixed, okay? And so this is what lets them at the margin bumble from plant to plant and they can still just about fly. And all I do there is I substitute the words I highlighted and I say cooperation has symbolised the inadequacy of game theory as applied to humans and the hubris with which theoreticians analyse the social world. So I just do a simple word swap. So we thinking lets game theory apply to a broader range of human social interactions. And that's it. <laughs> Five minutes over. <laughs> Everyone's convinced? <laughs>
Yes. Just a, a comment. On, obviously, the first years I was looking at uh, climate climate policy. It was sort of interesting how some, say California, has mm. gone for a carbon trading scheme. Mm. Um, I mean, I just think that's an interesting example of what you're describing mm. here, but where, you know, for, for no apparent economic law, because it Climate change is a prisoner's dilemma. Yeah, so, and the social one, yeah. You know, Australia is very much going for the you know, macho dominant strategy. Yeah. Uh, whereas other states are saying, you know, so it's almost collectively you're saying, well, all right, we'll show some leadership, we'll go for mm. the There is, but you see, there's also, I guess, uh, you know, to, to play the other side of it, the, the cost to the donor in Australia's case is higher than it would be for many others because we sort of specialise in uh, some cheap high quality coal mines and stuff like that I think as well so so to you know if you're if you're Singapore you don't have any of those industries you could you could go along quite easily with the cost to you is very light no I know but you could go along with it the cost would be very light actually so in fact you could so so the place there would be some places which you might expect from this kind of ratio to be the last on board uh, because you've got to have a higher a cooperative disposition, or we thinking, seeing it as a problem for us rather than a problem for us, sort of a problem for me. It, you have to be ab above a higher critical value before you jump in. And I think that might apply in Australia's case, given our balance of industries. But yeah, it doesn't mean you still can't do it. It just means that the threshold might be higher here than for some countries which don't have those industries. It would, it would give a rationalise it to some degree, yeah. Yeah, unless you can change the perceptions or raise our we thinking average level, or at least of the politicians. But it might show there's lower hanging fruit elsewhere we could be persuading first, I don't know. And then when you get a critical number of countries doing it, then the ostracism and social pressure would rise, so the, benef you know, the punishment fear would start to grow. Um, race to the top rather than yeah. race to the bottom. Yeah, yeah, you could try to change the dynamic, that's right, that's right, yeah. Because again, you know, I said there's a few people who... This is the other thing in prisoners' dilemmas, even really nasty prisoners' dilemmas, you still get six or seven or eight percent of people who cooperate. Now, a couple of them might be making a mistake, right? There. But, but this is really quite a common finding that a few percent, no more than that, but a few percent of people, they don't balance these things. They just want to go for the cooperative solution or the social good solution fully. They don't actually balance it at all. I've even found this in like dictator game things where you want, you know, they say you shouldn't, no one really wants to split. Uh, the money the dictator's been given, more than 50%, right? You might share half with the other person. I've found a couple of people, no, I want to give the whole 30 to the other person who I don't know. There's a few people like that out there. So, but you can't count on most people being like, that's one of the lessons here, don't count on that. Okay, you need to count because you're not going to find enough people uh, in any society for that. Um, but you can certainly play on this ratio, uh, I think, and uh, perceptions of the ratio and frames which trigger the we thinking for more people. Frame it in such a way. Frames and context effects, people are really, you know, nudging, basically. It's really starting to... Uh, I think that's what the World Bank is trying, you know, because they have a couple of reports that say, look at, look at what people are doing, you know. Yeah, like, yeah, demonstration effect. No, that, that helps too. Same thing, apparently, with charitable fundraising, you know, saying we've already got all these big donations uh, in, I mean, it always struck me as, well, well that makes me less willing to contribute because other people have already done it. But apparently it doesn't work that way. It actually, uh, that's if my contributions are a substitute for someone else's. But, you know, in a sense, in here it isn't. They're complements, right, in this kind of uh, game structure. So were any of the PhD students I was listening to in February here, uh, are they here, who were talking about some of this? Yeah? Is this different from what you were doing? It is, yeah. I do, yeah, yeah, yeah. As I say, I've sort of gone backwards a bit to talk about this. It was because I was hearing people like yourself. I thought, ah, oh. because so I had sort of too many things I want to say, so I thought maybe I'll just come and give a talk. <laughs> yeah. No, but the, the, this desire to cooperate, yeah. is this largely seeking approval? There's, uh, again, there's been um, some experiments where you've, where you've, really try and increase the social distance, they call it, where you even have a double-blind design, so even me doing the experiment, even I don't know which you were doing, in dictator games, and again, I don't think dictator games are quite the same as this. Uh, that's more an altruism thing. This is more about c 
come on, if we all act together, we can achieve something that's great for all of us. Just don't free ride. Altruism is a bit different from that. Am I willing to give you something for nothing and just take the cost? Um, but even in those situations, they found when you have a double-blind design in dictator giving, instead of the median gift being about a quarter of the endowment and a substantial number of people giving half the endowment, where only a few percent offer nothing, uh, in a double-blind design, two-thirds offer nothing. Right, where you do, even the experimenter doesn't know what you've done. People say, oh, I'm going to keep it all. <laughs> so definitely there is, there is a reputation uh, aspect as well, and communication. In yeah. that case, where uh, you don't know and you can't be approved, mm. I mean, uh, curiously, that's, that's the strict Christian thing. Yeah. Do good things and make sure you don't tell anybody. Right, well, this is the golden rule of Kant as well, which you do find in various religions. You know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, you know, act on that maxim which you could wish was a universal maxim or something. Uh, that was Immanuel Kant. Um, and we do find a few people. Yeah, I'm going to, you know, some people do say, well, I'm thinking Solzhenitsyn and people, you know, let the lie come into the world, but not through me. Or, you know, I'm going to show people by my actions what I think people should be doing. And if you don't, well, maybe you'll learn. So some people do act like that, but the great majority of cooperation we find and, and contributions is not caused by that. It's there for a few percent in our experiments anyway. One last question. Do you, so you, you showed us a scatter plot of the prediction versus the actual. Yes. Do you have a similar graph for the other, with the other model, like where people are like making choice? Ah, uh, I didn't actually, no. I mean, obviously in the case of, uh, if I go back here. Um, in the case of the other model, basically, uh, you, for all the prisoner's dilemma games, your prediction for wherever you see this, this symbol or this symbol, all of those would be predicted down at zero. For all of them, it doesn't matter what the tension between the two motivations is because it's a dominated choice to cooperate, right? So you know for a fact that for the prisoners' dilemmas, it's going to do absolutely rubbish, except for the couple of nasty ones like this where it's only a few percent off. <laughs> uh, for the chicken games, it would certainly, I'd say, it would be under-predicting. Um, uh, but I, I, I did look at that, actually. I think it's in the, it might be in the paper. I think I did maybe have it. I didn't do a diagram for it. Yeah, no, I sort of forget exactly now because I didn't bring those slides. Yeah, it would be like if you want to show that your model is pretty better. Mm. Actually be yeah, you know, I tried that before, um, and they say no, no, this is that's a straw man. Every once you show something, they say, oh, everybody knows that the sand model doesn't work. You know, even though they carry on as if it does everywhere else. Uh, so no, no, there's other theories of social preferences out there, so you should be comparing against them. I did look at one of the most uh, uh, well-known ones, or heavily cited ones, on sequential reciprocity equilibrium, which is a generalization of Rabin's Fairness in Games from 1993. Uh, and I solved for the critical parameter there for cooperation defection, and it had absolutely no predictive power whatsoever for these games. And I say that, uh, oh, I might not want this recorded, because Martin's my friend, and it was his paper. Uh, <laughs> So uh, delete that. Do it. Go and uh, delete that part yeah. on the recording. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Thanks.